Welcome back to Tim and Sid, both TV and radio. The Montreal Canadiens will look for their third straight win tonight when they host the Blackhawks on Scotiabank. Wednesday night hockey coverage on Sportsnet begins with Hockey Central at 7 p.m. Eastern. Not far from now, Elliot Friedman will be a big part of tonight's panel. And you can read his 31 thoughts. Call him on sportsnet.ca. He joins us now for three of those 31 thoughts. Brought to you by the next generation GMC Sierra Denali with the world's first available six-function multi-pro tailgate. Fridge, welcome back to the show. Good to be here. What the hell is going on in Vegas? Good question, Tim. That's a it's a great question. I mean, I mean, we're all shocked by this today. I don't know anybody who uh, who wasn't surprised, except for maybe the people who made the decision. Um, the thing that's the most amazing thing about it too was I'd heard some rumblings that they were working on a contract extension for the man that you see there, Gerard Gallant, and uh, I was actually going to look into it for this week's headlines. It's a good thing I didn't report it last week. <laughs> yeah. I would have looked really dumb. But you know, I'd heard rumors that they were looking at extending him. And I, I just guess in the last few days, it changed. They looked at the way they were going. They didn't like where they were going, and they decided to make a move. And, you know, I, I, you know, I think that year, 2018, it was such a magical year. It was one of the greatest years I, I've ever had the pleasure of covering in hockey, watching Vegas go to the Stanley Cup final and getting to be a small part of watching that run. But maybe it just raised the expectations to an unrealistic place because I don't think by uh, by – any real measure, you could look at this and say this is a coach who deserved to be fired. That's twice now that, you know, Gerard Gallant has has been in situations with uh, really bizarre changes. Fred, you mentioned the run a couple of years ago, and I'm not saying Gary Bettman would, would meddle either way, but considering the feeling in that market and how new it is and how successful it has been, there's no way the commissioner's office is happy with seeing this today considering how the market, as young as it is from a hockey sense, could react to it. Is that a concern at all from the league standpoint? I don't think so. I, I mean, I, I can't see the commissioner getting involved in something like this. I mean, he may, might be as surprised as everybody else is. I, I, I wouldn't have thought to even ask him, but I can't see. I mean, that, that market is a huge success. And those fans, those are good fans. And the league is very lucky to have them. Um, I, I can't see him having any particular reason. As you know, if the team wins, uh, all of this gets forgotten. Are you surprised it's Pete DeBoer that replaces him, especially given the history between the two teams? Uh, no, uh, because, number one, I think if you're going to replace Gerard Gallant, you better have a good coach, and I think Peter DeBoer is a good coach. And number two, I think people are generally mercenary, so if a job <laughs> comes open and it pays, uh, I don't know many people are going to turn it down. I don't know what you're talking about, Fridge. I have no yeah. idea. So then how long, the next question is, do you think, I mean, this has been unbelievable to see coaches yeah. getting fired and then picking up a new gig. I mean... Gerard Gallant, that's that's a great name if you're out there looking for a coach. Well, if you take a look at it, I think both Peter DeBoer and uh, John Hines were unemployed for less than 40 days. And I, and I think, you know, we're, we're at seven coaches fired this year, although two of them for very different reasons. And the record is 11 for one season. And I think one of the reasons that we're seeing changes is that people are looking out there and seeing some of the names out there and saying, well, if I'm going to make a change, I better be able to improve my lot. And all of a sudden, there's, there's coaches out there and you're saying either I'm comfortable with them or I really like what they've done. And I do think that adds to the churn. Like, absolutely, you know, Gallant's going to be unemployed as long as he wants to be unemployed. And Peter Laviolette's a guy whose history is to turn teams around too. So uh, I could see coaches in current spots saying, I'm not thrilled that that guy's out there. Um, Peter Laviolette is also out there. Yep. Mike Babcock yep. is also out there. Mm -hmm. who's, who's, who's the guy of those big names that gets the next gig, do you think? Probably, I, I mean, probably Gallant if he wants it. Yeah. Um, you know, he might need to take time. You know, I, one of the teams that almost hired Gallant was uh, Dallas a few years ago, but they're going really well right now under Rick Bonus. You know, they're yeah. they're really improving. They're competing. They're doing really well. They got a good win against Colorado last night. Do you change anything like that? I don't know if that's a really smart idea. You know, the other guy who's got a long history with with Gallant is is Steve Eiserman. But, you know, again, I don't profess to know what Steve Eiserman's thinking. I don't think he's going to offer too many clues. But the one thing everybody knows is, you know, if there's a coaching change there, that's a big job. And that's a job where there's not going to be winning anytime soon. 
So you know that you're going in there, you're going in there in a situation where you better be able to handle the stress of not, uh, not immediate results. And I don't know if Gerard Gallant's wired for that. If you're Seattle... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I sit- think he'd be on the list too. <laughs> but they got, but like you talk about go, walking through a grocery store on a shopping spree here and, and, and taking a pick of what you of what you want. They, there's no way they expected to have some of these names available that are currently available. Never mind a guy that went through what they're going to go through. Exactly. Absolutely, uh, I agree with you on that. No question about it. And Ron Francis said that he might wait uh, for another year to hire his head coach, but he did reserve the right to say, you know what, if someone comes available who we like, we'll do it. And, you know, I mean, you never know. We'll, we'll find out how he feels about some of these guys. Yeah. Good Over the last little while, Elliot Friedman, who is joining us from the Hockey Night in Canada studios in downtown Toronto, we, we've been talking about the Toronto Maple Leafs, their injuries on the back end. We were talking about the Montreal Canadiens and how they face the future with all of their injuries and some of the age and the key positions that they have. From what you're hearing, who's more likely to make a deal first, the Habs or the Leafs? It's a good question. I can't really say much about, like, the, the Canadians have decided they're going to meet next week and start to go over some of their stuff. There's a trade right there. No, Elliot Friedman I, I on the phone. Is. There is a tweet and no. an email. No, I don't think a so. A text and an email. All right, fine. <laughs> um, there's a, uh, I, I, the Canadians are going to wait till next week. You see, the thing for the Maple Leafs is, you know, if Riley's coming back during the year, you've got to account for a salary, right? Mm-hmm. So you can't just go out and add some big number unless you know you're not getting a unless you know you're not getting Riley back until the end of the season or the playoffs. So that makes their situation more difficult. I think with Montreal, it's going to come down to a: Are we still in the race? Are we making it appear as if so, and we're chasing as if we're still in it, or are we going to see what we can get for some of our players? And I think it's always easier to make that decision first. So if I had to, it's not based on any information, as is usual when I talk. <laughs> but, you know, if I had to make a pick, I'd probably say Montreal, though I don't base that on any confident prediction. Well, can you explain the Morgan Riley situation as you did to me yesterday when I called you and asked you what would happen if Morgan Riley uh, was out the rest of the year? Could they use that money? And when you get to the playoffs, there's no salary cap in the NHL, right? Oh, okay, so here's basically what you have to know. Imagine that I'm the general manager of a team that is at the salary cap, okay? And Tim, uh, you get injured in a game and Sid gets injured in a game playing for me. Now, I know this situation is already really far-fetched. Correct. I play hard, though. I can see it yeah, happening. You yeah. do play hard. I have yeah. no doubt about that. So <laughs> let's just say, let's make it easy. Sid, you're making $5 million. Tim, you're making $5 million. So all of a sudden, even though I'm right at the cap, I've got $10 million of cap room. I go out and I trade for Taylor Hall, who's making $6 million this year, Okay. Well, what if you guys come back before the end of the regular season, all of a sudden I've got I've added six million and I've got ten million coming back. So how do I make room for all that? However, if both of you guys are out until the playoffs, there's no salary cap in the playoffs, I can add Taylor Hall and then I can bring you both back when the playoffs start. And the team that did that to the best advantage was Chicago when they won the Stanley Cup in 2015. Patrick Kane was injured against Florida. They kept him, they went out and they got Antoine Vermette with cap room they didn't have. They just didn't bring back Kane until game one of the postseason. And if I could do the same thing, I would do it too. But the fact that... Does that make sense? No, yeah, definitely, definitely. So they uh, could just stash... If Morgan Riley agreed to it and you think you can get away with it, you could... Go out and get a five and million dollar defense, and you can make it look not contrived, right? And well, get the away thing with is, it. if he's legitimately injured, yeah. and you and and he's and he's legitimately not coming back till right before the start of the playoffs. No, I mean people will scream bloody murder, but as long as it's a legit injury, nobody can do anything about right. it. But the fact that we're even bringing this up as as an example of what a team may or may not be able to do, like that tells me the Leafs are in some trouble. Like the fact that we've even gone down this road from an mm-hmm. injury standpoint, from a cap standpoint, right? There, there's no other way to really read that, right, Fridge? Well, but how many- well, it's just that they've had years of pretty good health, and now it's all catching up to them. And in some ways, it's actually really helped them this year because they have the flexibility to potentially make moves that they didn't think they were going to have. You know, when you're in long-term injury, like they've been all year, you can't bank cap space. It's a right. squeeze. 
but because of these injuries, they have the possibility of at least considering some other things. You have to make sure you're aware of where you are when all these guys get back, but it has given them a bit of flexibility they didn't expect. I mean, the biggest difference, though, is that they haven't had a healthy team all year, and that affects everything you do. And the crazy part of it is, I mean, if you take out LTIR, there are 14 teams with under a million dollars in caps. It's not it's just tight. the Leafs. No, right? it's it's tight this year. I yeah. mean, and that's because last year the the league predicted the cap would go up by a certain number, and it was less. And teams didn't find out until right before free agency began on July 1st. And you know that's why there's that's why they're trying to do a better job of making a deal with the players' association in terms of where the cap's going to be next year for earlier. And it's possible they may set it for more than one year. They have considered that. Fred, you mentioned, just to double back on the Habs for a second, you mentioned a meeting next week uh, with yep. Habs hierarchy. Is, is that a Jeff Molson-ish type meeting? And, and what, what, how do we anticipate that meeting going? Like, What would the message be in it? I, I don't necessarily think that's the case with Jeff Molson. I think that next week's their bye week, and I think they always plan to get together. All these teams have their scouting meetings for both amateur and professional at this time of year. I think it's a good time for the Canadians with the break in the schedule to reset and kind of consider what they're going to do. And what do I expect? You know, I, I think that what I really expect is, you know, I, I, I think they'll see where they are and whether or not they really have a legitimate chance to get to the playoffs this year. I think they'll also decide if they don't, who they might be willing to move. I think the problem is if you if you weaken, if you trade too many guys with term, you, you may weaken yourself for next year too. And I don't think they want to say, okay, just because we're running off this year, we're going to write off next year also. So, you know, guys like Tatar, guys like uh, Petrie, they're going to have to make some decisions on them. I think the most interesting one is Petrie. Um, I think he's a talented guy. He's had a pretty good year. He's a right-hand shot defenseman. He's signed for one more season. Toronto got a pretty decent pack, or LA got a pretty decent package from Toronto for Jake Muzzin, an AHL player, a junior prospect, and a first rounder for a guy with another year under contract. Muzzin's a lefty, Petrie's a righty. I think Montreal will have to make a big decision on Petrie next year. He's going to be 33 years old. What kind of term do you give him? I think they like him as a player, but I wouldn't be surprised that if they you know, consider the possibility of seeing, okay, what could we at least get for him if we put him out there? But you're not as strong a team next year if you don't have Petrie. So I think they're going to be weighing all those kinds of decisions. Mm. Habs Blackhawks tonight, Scotiabank Wednesday night hockey. Uh, pregame show begins in about 15 minutes. Fridge, what, uh, what should we expect tonight? You know, we got a couple of really interesting things. Uh, Jeff Ward, the coach of the Calgary Flames, there in Toronto to play the Maple Leafs. He'll join us in the pregame. And in the first intermission, Christine Simpson did a piece uh, with uh, Steve Ludzik, um, who is uh, looking for a transplant right now. And she went with him uh, on a visit to uh, one of his um, medical appointments. Uh, Paul Coffey was there. Apparently, it's quite emotional. I haven't seen it yet. But Christine did a great piece last weekend with uh, the Thompsons, and I'm looking forward to seeing this one because I hear it's pretty good. Uh, old friend of ours, Steve Ludzik, if you can help yeah. out too, you can go to my Twitter account. I've uh, tweeted it out a couple times. I know Free just retweeted it as well. Uh, he was always a welcome member of our team. Oh, yeah. Good man. Uh, Freej, thanks for doing this. All right, guys. Have a good night. You too. There is uh, Elliot Friedman of Hockey Night in Canada and Scotiabank Wednesday Night Hockey. I will be tuned in for that tonight.